The 10k sub celebration continues. Last video I ranked my top 10 movie villains, the hardest list I've ever had to make. To make it a bit easier for myself, I decided to do a separate video for horror movie villains, and here it is. This list wasn't very hard to do at all actually. I did struggle a bit with a few of the entries, but overall I quickly knew which ones to include and where to put them. Like last time, I'll list the ones who were at one point included, but eventually got kicked off. They won't be as many this time though, but nevertheless stick through to the end to see who they were. I also have to mention that this list won't feature straight up creatures. By that I mean monsters who are really more concepts and not actual characters. Like for instance the xenomorphs and the thing. While I do love them, I can't call them characters and therefore in my opinion they don't qualify for a list like this. I will only include villains with actual motivation and personality, not mindless entities. If I did, the thing would have been number one, no contest. Actually the guys on this list aren't necessarily the scariest horror movie villains. because the very scariest often tend to be the mindless entities. We don't understand them and can't relate to them, and that makes them scarier. A horror monster we can sympathize with or rationalize automatically ends up being less scary. Of course, as usual, this list is my personal opinion only and not a supposed definitive list. Write down your favorite horror movie villains in the comments. Anyway, without further ado, here we go. Number 10. Dracula from the Hammer Dracula films. Hammer's Dracula was of course played by Christopher Lee, one of their staple actors who also played the mummy and Frankenstein's monster. The Dracula films spanned the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and all in all there were like 9 or 10 films made. Dracula was without a doubt Hammer's most popular and iconic monster, and is also my favorite of the lot. In fact, Lee's Dracula is the definitive Dracula to me. A lot of people obviously prefer Bela Lugosi, and he is the more classic Dracula, the one that started all the cliches. But to me, Lugosi's Dracula it's just a bit too tame and hasn't really aged all that well. Lee, on the other hand, has stood the test of time and perfectly combines the classic elegance of Lugosi with a far more animalistic and sinister flair. Lee's Prince of Darkness is a vicious demon from the depths of hell, a foul creature who reeks of evil. He's basically an animal in a human disguise, and that's what I feel Dracula should be, a blood-sucking bat creature who pretends to be human, but really the human surface is just that, a surface, a shallow shell. Clearly the movie makers were thinking thinking this too, considering Dracula doesn't speak a single word in some of the films, only hissing just like an animal. Most versions of Dracula, including Lugosi, is able to keep their human front intact a lot better, but Hammer's version is barely able to pull it off a lot of the time, maybe because his evil primal side is so strong, or perhaps he doesn't really care, who knows. Anyway, the main reason Hammer's Dracula works so well is of course because of Lee. There's been so many different actors who portray the character throughout the ages, but no one has been able able to capture the sinister side of the Dark Prince quite like him. I don't think anyone else could have pulled this version off. Lee, the ultimate villain actor, has such a commanding presence to him. He doesn't even really need to do anything, he can just stand there perfectly still and he just oozes charisma and evil. Number 9. Freddy Krueger from the Nightmare on Elm Street films Good old Freddy. I'm of course talking about the Robert Englund version. Does anybody even remember the remake? The one where Rorschach played Freddy. So anyway, Freddy here is the first of several slasher villains to appear on this list. There will be plenty of them. Me being the age that I am, I naturally grew up more on 80s and 90s slashers, not so much Hammer and Universal Monsters. Despite the fact that I rank Freddy the lowest of the slashers on this list, I do consider him to be the most unique and original among them by far. Many slasher villains are pretty generic just dudes in masks with kitchen knives. Sorry Michael and a thousand others. But Freddy is nothing like that. Freddy is the product of 100 maniacs. His mother, a nun, was raped by a hundred asylum inmates, and thus Freddy Krueger was born. Naturally, he was off to a bad start right from the beginning. To no surprise to anyone, he grew up to become a serial killer, targeting teenagers and kids. Eventually he got caught though, but was soon released on a technicality. Concerned parents then took the law into their own hands, and burned Freddy to death. That wasn't the end for the sadistic killer though, it was merely the beginning. Freddy returned from the grave and continued to haunt the teens of Elm Street as a sort of dream creature, an entity that lives inside people's dreams. We all know the story of course, if Freddy kills you in the dream, you die for real. And inside the dream world, he's got all kinds of powers, while he's fairly weak in the real world. Such an awesome concept. Freddy kinda feels like a comic book villain, a disfigured killer who can manipulate dreams. Dr. Destiny anyone? 
He's got a wacky personality too and is a bit of a joker. Of course as the movies went on he got a bit too silly. Remember the freaking power glove? His visual design is great and unique too. The burned face, the fedora, the striped sweater and of course a bladed glove. Easily the coolest slasher weapon. If I'm honest, Freddy is probably the greatest slasher villain of them all. But he's not quite my personal favorite. Still, I do love him a lot. Number 8. Billy Chapman from Silent Night, Deadly Night The killer Santa in his 1984 slasher was played by Robert Brian Wilson. Whatever happened to him? Silent Night, Deadly Night is an unusual slasher, because we get to see the movie through the killer's eyes. He's the protagonist, not his victims. The first half of the movie is dedicated to Billy's origin, as we're shown his slow descent into madness. As a kid, Billy goes visiting his crazy old grandpa with his family during Christmas. His grandpa warns him about Santa Claus telling him how Santa punishes those who have been bad. Shortly afterwards while driving home, they're stopped by a man dressed like Santa, who then proceeds to murder Billy's dad and rape and murder his mom. Billy and his infant brother are the only survivors. They're then sent to live at an orphanage run by a cruel mother superior who likes to punish so-called bad kids. Naturally, she picks on Billy and treats him worse than anyone else. Finally, at the age of 18, Billy, now working at a toy store, is forced to dress as Santa during Christmas. And and that's when he finally snaps. Wearing his Santa costume and wielding an axe, a completely deranged Billy goes on a hunt for people who's been naughty. Explaining it like that might make it all sound a bit silly, but it works really well in the movie. Unlike Freddy or any other slasher killer, Billy Chapman has a slow and believable descent into lunacy. More and more just keeps piling on top of him, pushing him further and further. It isn't just one single event that sets him off, which would have been silly, but a long string of events spanning several years years. You really feel sorry for Billy. You actually feel more sorry for him than anyone he kills. Most of them are unlikable jerks anyway. Billy Chapman is easily one of the most tragic and sympathetic slasher killers out there. And you probably wouldn't suspect that just by looking at the poster for the movie. It looks like stupid schlock. And in a way it is, but it is also a sad and disturbing character study. The sequels, and there are many of them, are supposedly trash though. I've never seen them, but I do of course know that part 2 features this infamous scene. Garbage day! Number 7. Mama from Mama Mama, the monster of this 2013 horror flick, was played by Javier Botet and voiced by several different actresses. Mama was once Edith Brennan, a mentally deranged woman back in the 1800s. When Edith was sent to the asylum, her baby was taken away from her. However, she later escapes from the asylum and takes the baby back. A panicked Edith runs through the woods with her baby until she reaches a cliff. The unstable woman jumps from the cliff down into the water below where she dies, while the baby gets caught on a branch and also dies. Of course, since this is movies, Edith continues to stalk the area as a ghost, looking for her baby. As she's unable to find it, she remains on our plane of existence for over a hundred years. In modern times, a ghost runs into a crazed dad who's taken his two young daughters to a rundown cabin in the area. Having suffered a financial crisis, the dad plans to kill his two daughters and then himself. But Mama stops him. She then takes the two young kids into her care, substituting her baby with them, while in turn they begin to regard her as their mother. A few years later, the dad's brother finally discovers the two girls though and takes them back to civilization. Of course, Mama can't have that. Someone trying to take her babies away from her once again. So she follows too. And now I just spoiled the entire movie, because really all of that was a mystery that wasn't fully revealed until the end. Oh well, I can't really talk about this character without spoiling it all. For most of the movie, Mama remains fairly unseen. We only get quick glimpses and shadowy silhouettes. And it's very creepy actually. They've also given her a very otherworldly quality in the movie, with her hair flowing like she's on the water. And she makes very bizarre and super fast body movements. Mama is easily the scariest entry on this list. By the climax though, we see so much of her that she loses most of her creepiness. But they kinda had to do that. Besides being scary, Mama is also very compelling. All she wants is her baby. And when she does crazy things, well, it's because she's crazy. It's also possible she's mentally impaired and simply doesn't understand the consequences of her actions. Yeah, a very sad character, and also a very cool and pretty unique ghost concept. Mama really feels less like a ghost and more like some kind of entity that escaped from the SCP Foundation. Why she didn't become a more traditional ghost I don't know, but I think she's better off for it. We've seen plenty of those already. Number 6. Henry Jarrett from the House of Wax 
I'm of course talking about the 1953 version, not the one with Paris Hilton. Vincent Price, another legendary villain actor like Christopher Lee, plays Professor Henry Jared, an eccentric and famed wax figure sculptor in the early 1900s. Jared runs a small wax museum in New York City together with his partner, a greedy businessman. The partner wants out of the operation though since business isn't doing so great. So he gets the brilliant idea of burning down the museum and then collecting the insurance. Of course, Jared can't have that. He loves loves his figures and even considers them to be sort of alive. He's a bit kooky. So a fight ensues and the partner burns down the museum with Jared in it. Jared survives though and later returns as a mysterious figure stalking the night, collecting bodies for his new wax museum. You see Jared is planning a smash comeback, but this time his figures will be made from real people. The first addition to this chamber of horrors will of course be his former business partner. If you've seen this movie you probably suspect that this guy would be on the list somewhere. A tragic, disfigured freak stalking the night in a cloak and hat. That sort of stuff is right up my alley. Jared really has the feel of a Batman villain. He even kinda looks like the original Clayface, Basil Carlo. I could easily imagine this guy in an old Batman comic, before they got too silly. Now Jared is not really a bad guy at all. Well, not at first anyway. He was just minding his own business, tending to his wax figures. Sure he was a bit weird, but certainly not dangerous in any way. He actually seemed very friendly. The real villain here is the business partner. He's the one who turns Jared into this monster. It's not the scarring that drives Jared mad though, it's the loss of his wax figures. They were his entire life after all, and I suppose he kinda saw them as his family. Already being a bit odd, it's no wonder he went so nuts, and basically became an extreme and twisted version of himself. Price is great in the role of course, and I also really like the scarring. It's grotesque, yet a bit comic booky too at the same time. And naturally the gimmick of making people into wax figures is really cool. Number 5. Candyman from the Candyman Films Another slasher killer, Candyman was played by Tony Todd. Candyman stands out among the slasher crowd though, because he's not in any way schlocky or comedic. He's played entirely straight and serious. So for those who don't know, the man who would be the Candyman was an artist in post-slavery 1800s America. At one point, the future Candyman met and fell in love with a white woman, and they entered a relationship. This the community simply could not have, so they abducted the man, sawed off his right hand with a rusty old saw, and smeared his entire body in sweet honey. A swarm of angry beasts then finished him off. The poor fellow then became a spirit of sorts, a vengeful ghost with a hook for a hand who haunts the area and brutally murders anyone who summons him. In order to summon him, you must stand in front of a mirror and whisper Candyman five times. He shall then appear. It's a lot of crap though, I've tried it. The Candyman, now an urban legend, still haunts the area as long as people believe in him. It's the people's belief that keeps him around. I love urban legends and I love tragic villains, so how could I not love the Candyman? He's also got a cool hook for a hand, another plus. The whole Candyman concept is of course one giant homage to urban legends. The bit about saying his name in front of a mirror, that's straight out of Bloody Mary. We used to do that a lot here as kids. Pretty stupid, but fun. The hook hand is naturally taken from the old Killer with a Hook legend. The one they also made an entire film series about. I know what you did last summer. I'm sure there's other urban legends in there as well. I suppose Suppose Candyman easily could have been kinda lame, just a bunch of loose urban legend references, but they tied it all together nicely with a great character. The urban legend aspects are cool, yes, but it's the tragedy of the character himself that truly elevates Candyman. As a ghost, he's very evil, yes, he kills innocent people, even kids, but he did get a pretty raw deal in his formal life. You can understand his rage and hatred. Plus, I'm not quite sure he's entirely in control of his actions. You almost get the feeling Candyman is cursed into doing all of this. Todd is great in the role of course, I'm not sure if anyone else could have pulled it off like he did. He perfectly portrays the sadness, the elegance, the creepiness and the brutality of the character. Speaking subjectively, I'd say that after Freddy, Candyman is probably the best slasher killer. Number 4. Sadako Yamamura from The Ring so just like with Darth Vader, when I say Sadako, I only mean the original Sadako, not what came after. With Sadako though, it's even more specific. I only mean the very first film, The Ring or Ringu from 1998. The character and her backstory was turned into the most convoluted mess I've ever seen in the later films. We got sequels, prequels and all kinds of crap that made no sense whatsoever. So just disregard all of that. I do. Anyway, so in the first film, Sadako was played by Rie Ino, an actress who doesn't 
seem to have done much else. Sarako and her mother were born with strange psychic powers and eventually became media sensations. This intrusive attention combined with harassments took its toll on Sarako's mother and she later committed suicide. Sarako was then taken into the care of a doctor, the same man who had discovered her and her mother's abilities in the first place. He eventually threw poor Sarako down into a well though and there she died slowly. Honestly, I don't even remember why he killed her, but anyway, Sadako naturally became a ghost, because of course, and cursed a VHS tape, because why not? This part everybody knows. If you watch the tape, Sadako will come crawling out of your TV set one week later and scare you to death. So just like Candyman, Sadako is an angry ghost who wants to make the entire world suffer like she does. She doesn't care who she kills, anyone will do. She's like a melodramatic supervillain, a very creepy melodramatic supervillain. And how could I not love that? Sadako becoming a ghost though makes more sense than Candyman or Mama. They were just ordinary people, while Sadako had psychic powers. She was already supernatural from the start. It's with these powers that she's able to cling to our world even after death, and also curse a VHS tape. Why a tape? I'm not sure, but it is a really cool gimmick, and clearly also based in urban legends. What's also cool is her crawling out of a freaking TV set. When I first saw that years ago, not knowing it would come, I almost fell out of my chair. Definitely one of the greatest scenes in horror movie history, right up there with the chestburster scene from Alien. The look of the character is also very creepy, the long wet hair always obscuring her face. You don't know what she looks like underneath, and that makes her all the more scary. Of course, this design, based on old traditional on Japanese ghosts, yureis, has become a cliché. It's constantly aped in other movies, but it worked perfectly for Sadako. Number 3. Chucky from the Child's Play Films so here we have yet another slasher killer, and also finally another villain who's not sympathetic whatsoever. Ironically, this horror list consists of mainly sympathetic villains, while the other one mainly featured pure evil ones. Charles Lee Ray aka Chucky, played by Brad Dourif, is a psychotic serial killer known as the Lakeshore Strangler. During a shootout with a police detective, Chucky is fatally injured. The dying killer makes his way to a toy store where, as a last resort, he uses a voodoo spell to transfer his consciousness into a good guy's doll. Chucky now possessed the plastic body of this doll, and in this bizarre guise continues his killing sprees, while also searching for a suitable human body to swap over to. So Chucky here is my second favorite slasher villain. I've always just loved the concept of this character, a serial killer who possesses the body of a doll. That is absolutely awesome. And Chucky is another one who feels like he could have been a comic book villain. I could easily see Batman fighting him. But then again, I'm always thinking about Batman because I'm upset so maybe it's just me. It would have been interesting to see a toy man and Chucky team up. Anyway, I love the personality of Chucky. He's a bit of a joker, just like Freddy. In fact, I think those two would have gotten along fantastically. Also, just like Freddy, they went way too far in the sequels and made him too goofy. But anyway, speaking only of the two first movies, I think they handled Chucky perfectly. A crude, sadistic lunatic in the body of a toy. Maybe not the scariest thing ever, but very entertaining. Chucky looks really creepy though. Just look at that freaky little mug of his. That is disturbing. I prefer him before he got all the scars. The scars are just too much and feel like they're trying too hard to make him scary. Simplicity is sometimes better. Of course I understand why they did it plot-wise. It kinda had to be done. Although not really, because they shouldn't have made any more movies after the second one. But whatever. Hollywood likes to milk stuff. Anyway, Chucky is great. A really creepy little bastard and a badass concept. Number 2. The Invisible Man from The Invisible Man so here we finally have a classic universal monster. In fact, the invisible man here is the only universal monster on the list. I know, I should be ashamed of myself. As much as I like the rest, I just couldn't include any of them. That would have meant I would have to kick off someone else off the list, and I couldn't really do that. As I said, I like all the universal monsters, to varying degrees, but the invisible man has always been my very favorite. I've only seen the first movie though, from 1933, starring Claude Rains. I think we all know the plot of it. Even if you haven't seen it, you can basically figure it out. Scientist Jack Griffin invents an invisible formula and uses it on himself. He then begins to go mad, both from the power that invisibility grants him and from the formula eating away at his brain. So simple, but so great. I've talked about this many times before, but I just absolutely love these types of characters. Well-meaning scientists who accidentally transform themselves into some kind of monsters. Jack Griffin is not an evil man. He's driven evil by the serum. In fact, he's driven deliciously evil. I love how sometimes he uses 
uses his powers to just mess with people, like a mischievous prankster, while at other times he schemes truly sinister plots like a proper supervillain. But no matter how evil he becomes, there's always that hope he'll reform. There is still some of Jack Griffin left in The Invisible Man after all. If anything is able to bring Jack back to the surface, it's his love for his fiancée. Yes, that's right, he has a fiancée, a woman who mourns his descent into madness. It's whenever we see these two together that we really remember that this man hasn't always been a monster. It's during those moments we get to see his humanity, his former self. Choosing the Invisible Man as my favorite Universal monster may be a bit of an odd pick. Most people would probably go for either Dracula or Frankenstein, or even the Mummy. But yeah, for me it's always been Jack Griffin. He's a truly tragic and fascinating villain. I also like the visual of the character, ironically. A man in a suit with his face covered in all that weird shit. Bandages, goggles, a fake nose. It looks very bizarre. I of course don't even need to mention the special effects, which are absolutely amazing considering it was 1930. Three. And now for my very favorite horror movie villain. Number 1. Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th films. Jason here was the only one who gave me real trouble on this list. I wasn't sure if I should put him as my number one or include him at all. I feel kinda dumb putting Jason Voorhees as my number one. After all, the Friday the 13th series is stupid schlock. While I like some of the movies, none of them are great. They're all cheap, dumb crap. Let's not kid ourselves here. But despite that, I've always really liked the character of Jason. The hockey mask hiding a grotesque face underneath is simply awesome. Choosing a hockey mask was a masterstroke too, as there's just something really intimidating about it. Of course I kinda did that on accident. They were looking for a mask for Jason to wear in the third movie and one of the crew members who was a hockey player happened to have his hockey gear with him on set. And the rest is history. What a silly coincidence. But in a way it just adds to the awesomeness of the Jason mythos. The fact Jason keeps getting more battered and decayed every movie is also really cool. This is a guy who just won't quit, not even if his skeleton is showing. In fact it only seems to make him angrier and more badass. Kane Hodder is by the way my favorite performer to portray Jason. Nobody is as intimidating in the role as he was. It also helps that the hotter Jasons happen to have the greatest visual designs. Besides all of these superficial aspects though, I think somewhere deep down there's a really great character in Jason. After all, his backstory is very tragic. He was a deformed kid who was bullied and harassed by everyone but his mother. And then he drowned in Crystal Lake because the camp counselors weren't paying attention. They were too busy fornicating. That is why Jason always kills fornicating camp counselors. It's his eternal revenge. You could actually do a really sad drama film about Jason's childhood. But of course that'll never happen. The character will always be associated with cheap schlock. Because all of his movies are cheap schlock. I don't know, if I ever work in Hollywood, which I never will of course, the first thing I'll do is try to get a serious Jason movie off the ground. Of course nobody would greenlight such a project and the fandom would probably hate it anyway. Jason fans probably only want cheap schlock. Cheap schlock is fine, but I think Jason can do better. And that is why Jason Voorhees is my favorite horror movie villain. Plus the cool hockey mask. And now for the villains who were at one point actually included on the list. There's actually only two of them this time. The Mechanical Girl, played by Carmeta Cervera from Fragile. And Frank Cotton, played by Sean Chapman and Oliver Smith from Hellraiser. And then of course there's countless others that I very briefly considered, including Universal's Frankenstein's Monster and the Creature from the Black Lagoon, Hammer's Phantom of the Opera, Pennywise the Clown, Curry's version of course, Sal the Shark Maselli from Innocent Blood, and David Kessler from an American werewolf in London. Now I know there's tons of other iconic ones I haven't even mentioned, but you can't squeeze in everyone on a top 10. Anyway, don't forget to write down your favorite horror villains in the comments. The next video will be the last of our 10k sub celebration, and I think this one will interest you more. These movie lists aren't really getting that many views. Anyway, it's my top 20 Batman villains, a remake of the top 10 video I did 2 years ago. So stay tuned for that. And as always, remember, Arkham Asylum awaits you in the next video.